Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Critical Issues Forum Online Teachers Workshop. So now we are going to start the second part of uh, Ferenc's lecture, the effect of the use of nuclear weapons. So now, uh, Ferenc, microphone is yours. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about nuclear weapon effects. And um, it's, it's particularly special when I talk about nuclear weapon effects after the uh, success of the, um, uh, of the nuclear weapons ban uh, treaty, um, which I'm sure Masako will discuss in detail. But this is really talking about the effect that, that nuclear weapons can have. I don't show many, uh, you know, awful, terrible pictures because I find that it's most useful to look at um, uh, people, people who survived this, the, the paintings um, that they've produced. So um, in through the, through the lecture, I will um, show some of these paintings. On the right side, I'm actually showing, uh, so the left side is one of the paintings, I think from, from Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And from the right side of the picture, you can see um, uh, a woman um, at the Semi-Palatinsk uh, nuclear test site. So I'm going to talk about what happens in a nuclear explosion first. Then I'm going to talk about blast effects, thermal effects, um, radiation effects, and then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, nuclear winter and nuclear famine. Um, and this is a recent research, I mean, recent meaning um, over the last decade, um, which really changes our are thinking about the effect of uh, nuclear weapons. So what happens in, an, in, a, in a nuclear weapon? Well, in a nutshell, um, what happens is you produce a whole lot of energy, uh, produce pseudo-fission process, and that energy has nowhere to go. And it's essentially you increase the pressure and it explodes outward. And this can be a very, very, uh, as you know, a very devastating effect. And as I say, popular pictures of kind of the mushroom clouds kind of hide the horror that really happens underneath. Because if you look at this, um, in, in some sense, it even looks beautiful. But the horror of these explosions are just um, immense. Um, so nuclear explosions is not just a mushroom cloud. There's the blast wave, which is a high pressure wind, which travels out at speeds higher than the speed of sound. Um, causing massive, massive damage. Thermal effects that are caused by x-rays that turn to infrared light and other, other types of light that stream from the fireball and it causes fires and mass death. Radiation from particles, neutrons and gamma rays emitted from the fireball. So these are the bullets that I talked about um, earlier in the, in the previous lectures. This can cause mass uh, fat fatalities near the fireball but then there's also residual radioactivity due to fission products that decay long after the fireball has disappeared. Uh, neutrons streaming from the fireball during the ordinary uh, soil to rock to become radio radioactive. So what happens is the explosion happens if it's close to the ground, um, will turn basically the rock and the soil um, into radioactive materials, um, which will also decay and, and, and release these bullets and that I talked about. And, and these cause deaths that can last for decades. So it's really, really horrible. When um, Masco asked the question about the different uh, uh, effects of a nuclear weapon and how it's really different from a conventional explosion, you have to think about all these different things. In a conventional explosion, you talk about the blast wave. That's really most of the effect. Of course, there's also uh, fires and so on, but it's not as extreme as this is in terms of the thermal effects, the radiation and um, residual radioactivity. So to tell you about how a nuclear weapon uh, um, explodes, I'm going to go in a little bit more detail and I, I hope uh, th that you'll um, kind of appreciate this um, because it gets a little bit hairy. <laughs> um, uh, you can kind of think of when an explosion happens, there are two expanding spheres from the explosion a debris sphere and kind of an X-ray sphere. So two spheres that explode outward um, that both keep damage. So keep in mind the story of the, uh, the tortoise and the hare. Um, the tortoise is the debris sphere 
which is a red ball which moves outward, which I'm gonna, I'm going to show you a little later on. And the X-ray sphere is the dashed ball. So in one millionth of a second after the explosion happened, all the yield is deposited in the bomb materials. It heats the material to very high temperature, 10 million um, Celsius, uh, essentially. So a very, very high temperatures. When objects are heated to high temperatures, it tends to emit radiation. And what it emits in this case are X-rays. So these are X-rays that are the same X-rays, uh, energies that you would have, for example, if you go uh, into a clinic and you get an X-ray. Now these X-rays, they travel a couple of millimeters to a couple of meters. It's not like it, the, the sphere itself that I'm showing you, the dash sphere, expands very quickly. It actually doesn't move at the speed of light. But it is a rapidly expanding X-ray sphere that goes outward. So you have enormous pressure in a very small space. Um, and the debris sphere, this is the red, red sphere here, starts to heat up and pressure starts to build. And the temperature increasing means the atoms are jiggling back and forth much faster. And each little atom carries a kick. And the collective kick is the massive pressure uh, that you have. And the debris ball will slowly expand compared to the X-ray sphere. So the X-ray sphere is expanding faster than the debris sphere itself. In fact, the debris sphere in the end will become supersonic and will travel faster than the speed of sound. So we have two separate spheres that are carrying energy outward. As the X-rays travel much faster, but it loses energy as the time evolves. Then you can ask the question, how can it be since, they, since X-rays travel at the speed of light? Well, the fact is what's happening is not that the X-rays are, are, are moving at speed of light, they're getting, they are of course moving at speed of light, but they get, they get absorbed by the atoms and then they get re-emitted and absorbed and re-emitted and this actually slows, slows the expansion down of this X-ray sphere. So at one point, the debris sphere will overtake the X-ray sphere and this is this idea of the story of the tortoise and the hare. The debris sphere expands faster than the speed of the sound in the air and actually becomes a shock wave, and this is the blast wave. And the X-ray sphere is uh, it's called the isothermal sphere. It's called the isothermal sphere, I think, because the X-rays, X -rays, it, it changes from being X-ray to another uh, type of ray, essentially another type of uh, light ray, is extremely, uh, extremely bright, but it's hidden behind the debris sphere. So now, as time continues, uh, the it's really, you know, we, we talked about one, 100 millionths of a second. Now we're talking about a millisecond later or a fraction of a millisecond later. Um, now what's glowing is this r uh, bright red sphere that I'm showing here, which is the debris sphere itself. It glows at about 1% of the total thermal energy output of the bomb. This is the first bright pulse that you can see from the bomb. But remember that the X-ray sphere is hiding behind here. And the X-ray sphere itself, the isothermal sphere, is actually much, much, much brighter uh, than, that, uh, than the uh, debris sphere. So a split second later, the debris shockwave sphere starts to slow down and stops glowing and becomes transparent to the much brighter X-ray sphere or isothermal sphere, um, which now glows at 8,000 degrees Celsius. So it's actually not X-rays anymore. Uh, now it's more like an infrared sphere. And 100 milliseconds after the de detonation, 99% of the thermal energy is in the second pulse, and that's this, this isothermal sphere that is, uh, that, that is giving off uh, so much light. So there's really two, two, uh, um, two, two bangs, really, two, two bright spheres. The first bright sphere was the one coming from the debris, and the second bright sphere is from the isothermal sphere. And this heats everything its way. So the debris shockwave doesn't, doesn't glow, but continues to travel outward. And this is the shockwave that becomes a blast wave later on, which travels out and it carries about 50% of all the destructive energy uh, of the bomb itself. The light from the isothermal sphere is, becomes now visible. So this is uh, some time after the, uh, you know, milliseconds after the, after the bomb detonated. Um, and it's infrared and, it, and, and also other wavelengths and it heats everything in its way thousands of times brighter than the sun and causes flash blindness uh, many, many miles away. And you can kind of think of it this way. 
um, if you're if you're talking about something which is like uh, 4,000 Kelvin, and you can think of this as Celsius at this level, it's got many different uh, wavelengths. It, it, some of it is going to be invisible light, some of it's going to be infrared light, some of it's even going to be ultraviolet light. So you have this bomb um, emitting all kinds of wavelengths of light that can do a damage and um, uh, to the environment is going to be talking about. So it's really two pulses that are released. The first pulse is the pulse coming from uh, the uh, uh, from the debris sphere, as I was as I was talking about, and it's a much lower energy. And then there's the uh, the uh, second pulse, which is the isothermal energy, uh, isothermal sphere, or what was the X-ray sphere, and as later becomes the infrared sphere, essentially gives off 99% uh, uh, of the energy compared to the 1% for the, um, <coughs> for the um, uh, debris sphere. <coughs> they actually used this technique to detect nuclear explosions from space. So since they recognize that only a nuclear explosion has these two different pulses, one pulse coming from the debris sphere essentially and the second pulse coming from the isothermal sphere, if from space you see an explosion and you see these two quick uh, pulses, one occurring at about a millisecond and one uh, about a hundred milliseconds later, um, then you can recognize that this must be coming from a nuclear test. These uh, detectors, by the way, were called bangometers. Um, if the test was conducted on, under, on, on the ground itself, so not actually at a certain altitude from the, from the ground, uh, then you would have a mushroom cloud. So this is for the atmospheric tests that are really conducted on the ground. And what happens is, as the explosion happens, the fireball moves upward and it kind of drags all the, all the dust and the debris uh, from the ground upward um, like this into this kind of mushroom clouds. And it's important to remember that a mushroom cloud uh, doesn't only happen with a nuclear explosion. Um, it can happen with just uh, very large explosions. And it's often what happens is, um, People, miss, people see a mushroom cloud and, they, uh, and, and, and this has happened in Ukraine and, and also in Syria. Um, they see these large explosions and they assume that it's nuclear, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, that has to do with just being a very large explosion and, and, and sucking up the material. In fact, in the case of a, uh, uh, a uh, what's called an, an air burst, uh, an explosion which I'm gonna be talking about later, which is conducted um, at a certain altitude to magnify the effect of the bomb, uh, then you don't really get a mushroom cloud. You just get a fireball, um, which expands outward. Now the fireball itself that you have from the mushroom cloud, the mushroom cloud itself, it rises very fast. In fact, 200 and 250 uh, miles per hour is the rise of the fireball. So it really expand, moves up very fast. Now when you have a general nuclear bomb explosion, um, the way the energy is partitioned is that uh, about 50% uh, of the energy is uh, blast waves. So this is the energy from the shock waves um, as it expands outward. 35% is uh, essentially thermal energy that's released. So this is electric, uh, le electromagnetic radiation or basically light rays essentially of different wavelengths. Uh, and 50%, 15 is going to be uh, nuclear radiation. Some of that's going to be prompt neutrons and gamma rays, so these are basically very high, high energetic um, light particles that can cause a lot of damage. These are really powerful bullets. Uh, and others are just material that's been deposited on the ground uh, that's radioactive and, and over time releases, uh, releases these little bullets, little particles. So the total energy adding this 35 plus 50 plus 15 percent is the total energy is the TNT yield of the bomb itself. So let's talk first about the effect of the blast waves. Now this shows you a, a ground explosion and you can see how the fireball is expanding outward. Um, you can see the shock front, if you look at it very carefully, you can kind of, in this image, you can see a shock front actually moving outward. And that's essentially the, uh, the blast wave moving outward, but it hasn't actually met the air yet. So it's traveling outward and the air doesn't really have enough time to get out of the way, and so it produces kind of a shock wave um, that moves outward. Now, a useful way of thinking about shocks is, think of a bomb as dropping a stone in a quiet pond. The waves will travel outward in concentric circles and disturb the water. 
and that's a little bit like um, uh, like how, but that's of course in two dimensions. But in three dimensions, you can you can you can imagine that this. Sorry about that. You can imagine that this this shock wave travels spherically outward. It's not a continuous wave. It's not like a wave that keeps on going. It's just one circular wave which moves outward, more like a tsunami than you know a regular water wave. Um, the the shock waves travel out and compress the air, and this pressure that it, that it actually produces when it compresses the air is measured in pounds per square inch or uh, psi, and Depending on how on what the PSI is going to be um, depends on the damage is a measure of the damage. So if you have an overpressure, which is something like 100 PSI, it's a very high pressure um, that will do a lot of damage. Um, you also have with this effect a uh, basically the blast wave produces a wind, and these winds can be extremely high, as you can see here. If it's a 10 PSI overpressure, it's equivalent to about a 300 miles per hour uh, wind. If it's 20 PSI, it's a 500 miles per hour. So very, very intense uh, winds that can uh, damage, uh, damage everything, just as a hurricane uh, would. So blast waves travel outward and push the air outward and compresses it. The compressing air creates a, front, a shock front, which has really two effects. It's called static overpressure and dynamic overpressure. And static overpressure is an increase in the local pressure of the, of the moving front. It's kind of like a tire running over your hand. The body is quickly squeezed inward, like diving too deep and the lung can collapse. So it's kind of this crushing effect. Whereas dynamic overpressure is really the high speed wind um, that you get. So static overpressure is more like an increase in pressure and the dynamic overpressure is really a wind that travels outward. Um, now, the pressure as a function of distance from the explosion is related to the yield, but maybe not in the way that you might imagine. I'm going to talk about that a little later. When you talk about hardening a missile so a silo or hardening a building, it really means that you're hardening the, the building itself to withstand a certain pressure. So that in that case, if you want to destroy that building, you would need to have a higher yield um, to destroy it or hit closer to it. <coughs> now, um, when a nuclear explosion happens, they don't necessarily explode it on the ground. They explode it in what's called an airburst. And the reason for that is it magnifies the effect uh, of the explosion itself. So, here, what I'm showing is not many waves. Not, this is not one wave and then wave, another wave, another wave. This is one wave, but as time continues, this is at, at time one, time two, time three, time four. So this is as a later time, as that spherical wave, which I'm showing now in, in kind of two-dimensional circles, as it moves outward and hits the ground. Now, when it hits the ground, it actually re reflects upward. So it hits the ground, but then reflects, just as a water wave would reflect when it hits the, um, uh, hits the side of something, like a boat or something, the, 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 the water uh, would reflect. And what happens is this incident wave that comes in and the reflected wave, they meet each other. And when they meet each other, they basically multiply the, the effect, essentially multiplies the pressure. So you have a larger effect when you get this, also this uh, reflected wave. That's called the Mach stem. So the combination of the reflected and the incident blast wave greatly enhances the destruction. So a factor of, uh, you actually push the distance out that you would get a certain pressure out by almost a factor of two. It's very, very dramatic effect. And here I show you a little video uh, of, of, of how this works. And this is from uh, an excellent, um, documentary from uh, the Japanese uh, broadcaster NHK. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit of this. To blast pressure intensified around 500 meters <coughs> from ground zero. We filmed that movement using a special device that can detect invisible flows of air. Here's how the blast expands from the center of the explosion. 
When the blast wave strikes the Earth, it is reflected upward to form a second dome-shaped shock wave. Let's focus on the area where the two waves meet. One shock wave comes from above as it expands from the core of the explosion. The other is reflected off the ground. The two blast waves then merge, more than doubling their individual pressure and continue expanding in a horizontal direction. The combined wave grows in height and strength as it moves along the ground. This is the shock wave known as the mock stem. We used a very small amount of explosives, but something much bigger like an atomic bomb or a huge amount of explosives or explosion would have generated the same kind of shockwave movement. The result of our experiment is in line with what happened in Nagasaki where mock reflection occurred at a short distance from ground zero and caused severe damage farther away. Okay, so that's the idea uh, with the max stem. So that's the, um, you want to call it an advantage, that's the advantage of, uh, this is why um, when, you, when you detonate a nuclear explosion, you don't really detonate on the ground, you detonate it at a certain altitude so that you can uh, magnify the effect. Now I'm going to talk about two different explosions. One explosion of 10 kiloton and one explosion of one megaton, okay? So the 10 kiloton is basically similar to a, uh, a, uh, uh, the explosion in, in Hiroshima, similar, similar size, um, whereas one megaton is a thousand kilotons or a hundred times larger explosion. Now what you might expect that is that if you had the, uh, the 10 kiloton explosion, a certain effect would be felt at say one kilometer. You would expect that a one megaton bomb, which is a hundred times bigger bomb in terms of the TNT yield, that instead of th that, that, that effect at 10 kilotons would have been at one kilometer, at one megaton would be a hundred kilometers because it's a hundred times larger. And that is not true. And that's a very important thing to understand about nuclear weapons and, and really all conventional explosion in terms of the effect is that the effect is not linear. It is not linear. So what I'm showing here is um, the effect here on the abscissa, the, the horizontal scale. So this is the uh, certain pressure where concrete buildings collapse. This is where wood frame buildings collapse and this would shatter windows. And what I'm showing is the distance in kilometers at which you would, uh, um, at which you would um, witness uh, that, that effect. So at about one kilometer, um, in, in a 10 kiloton bomb, at one, at, at one kilometer, concrete buildings would collapse. But at a one megaton bomb, which as I said, is 100 times larger, much larger bomb, that radius only expands to five kilometers. So not 100 kilometers, which you kind of might um, expect if the effect would be linear. And the same is true in this case with different pressure and the same is true in this, this pressure. So windows would be shattered from a 10 kiloton bomb at around five kilometers and for one megaton bomb would be shattered at about 22 kilometers. So it's not five kilometers and then 500 kilometers. It's not linear. So this is a very important, important point to emphasize uh, that the blast wave damage effects are not linear. Um, the same damage that occurs at a certain distance away for a 10 kiloton bomb in terms of blast does not occur at 100 times that distance for a one megaton bomb. <coughs> it's still very awful and I'm not trying to minimize any of this, but the effect is much less than you might have, um, might have expected. And just to give you a kind of quick explanation of why this is the case, Think that the effect of a 10 kiloton bomb is like a small little ball of a certain radius. And that's what I'm showing in this balloon with these little, little balls in them. Imagine stuffing 100 of those balls into a balloon. Into balloon. That would mean 100 times 10, that would be, mean a one megaton bomb. Now, 
the bomb won't actually expand 100 times the radius. And you can kind of see that here. If it would be 100 times, it would mean that I would put one, one bulb beside the next one, and 100 of these bulbs would expand outward much further than this does, because it's spanning out spherically um, in three dimensions. So that's really the reason why, uh, why that happens. But by no means am I minimizing um, the effect that, um, that you would get. So here I'm going to show you some images of a uh, ground burst explosion and the damage that is done to a, um, a, to, to a house. So the first thing is you have a bright light with a very rapid heating um, that you would get. Everything that we talked about, uh, the thermal effect, the, the house is basically on fire. You can see on the, the one side where the, from the side that the light is coming from. And then the blast wave arrives, which is such an immense, immense uh, um, wind that essentially destroys the house in less than three seconds. Very, very dramatic uh, set of images. So let's talk about the effect of the thermal radiation. Uh, it can cause very serious burns and can cause very serious fires. Even though I, as I, I kind of started this lecture, we talk about the science don't forget about the unspeakable horror um, that these explosions have. As I said, to me, the paintings are, are, um, are more powerful than the pictures ever can be. Um, these pictures were made by uh, survivors about what they, what they went through, incredible suffering. And this is uh, um, uh, testimony by uh, Madame Setsuko, Thurlow on accepting the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, processions of ghostly figures shuffled by, grotesquely wounded people. They were bleeding, burnt, blackened, and swollen. Parts of their bodies were missing. Flesh and skin hung from their bones, some with their eyeballs hanging in their hands, some with their bellies burst open, their intestines hanging out. The foul stench of burnt human flesh filled the air. Thus, with one bomb, my beloved city was obliterated. Most of its residents were civilians who were incinerated, vaporized, carbonized, among them members of my own family and 351 of my schoolmates. So what is this thermal uh, radiation? Um, this is all the light of different wavelengths, infrared and so on, that, that, uh, uh, that, that essentially become like the bullets and, and do uh, heat and do an immense amount of damage. If you think about it, you're creating an object on Earth hotter than the sun, thousands of times brighter, uh, and it will, burn, uh, it will burn everything. So you kind of have to think of this. It's a little bit equivalent to like if you, have a, if you were a kid, you played with magnifying lens, um, and you, you focused um, the, the light uh, rays from, coming from the sun onto a very small spot. And once you reach a certain uh, a, a certain energy per centimeter square that you're depositing in a certain area, it'll start to heat the paper and it will start to burn. In this case, paper burns at seven cal per centimeter square. Um, and um, if you had this kind of effect where you have 20 cal per centimeter square to, uh, per minute, uh, then paper would burn in less than 20 seconds. So, so if you have a very intense amount of uh, photons or light rays that, that hit a certain material, if you have enough of it, if you have enough energy, um, the material will start to burn. But also with thermal radiation, the effect is also not linear. So again, I'm showing a, uh, a, a 10 kiloton bomb and uh, a one megaton bomb. Um, and uh, you get uh, charred skin, an extreme pain, a third degree burn uh, up to about uh, two kilometers for a 10 kiloton bomb and up to about 11 kilometers for a, a one megaton bomb. And you can see blisters and severe pain uh, extend outward to this. You can kind of see the, uh, the, the, the terrible uh, effect of the uh, thermal effect. So a one megaton bomb will give a serious sunburn from 20 kilometers away, a third degree burn at um, 11 kilometers. Uh, 
Now, um, ignition can happen for different materials at different cows. So this is basically energy per centimeter squared. For newspaper, it's something like, of course, it depends what kind of newspaper it is. It's 40, 4 to 15. For dry wood, it's 4 to 8. Uh, for deciduous leaves, it's 4 to 8. Coarse grass is 6 to 11. And if you take that into account, then a 100 kiloton bomb can ignite grass at three miles away. So you can now understand um, how these bombs can produce such terrible, uh, terrible fires. So in Hiroshima, there were these massive fires um, started by thermal radiation that combined, the fires combined uh, and formed these uh, super fires. Uh, and then you basically have a high velocity winds which get, which get directed towards the center of the fire. Uh, they basically, the, the, the fires themselves develop their own wind patterns and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you get these very severe uh, firestorms. Firestorms developed in Hiroshima about 20 minutes after the explosion. Uh, and, and, and the death was caused to people by heat or suffocation because the, uh, the fires needed to suck all the oxygen out of the air. So even if you were in a shelter, uh, there may not have been enough oxygen to breathe. Yeah, the effect is, uh, are, are, is, is really horrible. Um, so this is for Hiroshima. Uh, if you have a, uh, at, at about um, 1.5 kilometers, you have 50% 50, 50 of the casualties were due to blast and 50% were, um, were due to burns. Further away, as you get further away, uh, other, other effects will uh, contribute to the fat fatality rate. Let's talk about the effect of radiation. Um, as I always say, even though we talk about science, don't forget the unspeakable horror. So first you have the initial radiation, which is really the, the fission bomb. The radiation is released within the first minute, prompt gammas and neutrons um, that penetrate deep into the ground from a rising fireball. Um, that's if the explosion was uh, close to the surface. If it's at a much higher uh, altitude uh, explosion to really cause the max stem, in that case, the, uh, the effect is, uh, uh, from this initial radiation is going to be uh, not as much because the neutrons and the gamma rays simply can't make it uh, to the ground, get absorbed before it, get hits the, before it gets to the ground. Um, it's a reason why it's possible to live in Hiroshima now, because the explosion happened at a certain altitude. And so at least the uh, effect from the initial, uh, um, initial radiation was not as high. And also in Hiroshima itself, the, the radioactive fallout, which is the debris, the radioactive debris, uh, traveled elsewhere and deposited elsewhere, not necessarily in the, in the city itself. There is residual radiation, and I already touched on this, but it's called neutron activation. Basically, um, if the explosion is near to the ground, then the uh, neutrons coming from, from the fission process, essentially, neutrons that are produced uh, will, will, will hit materials in the ground, and, it, and through that process, it actually produces radioactive materials through the neutrons hitting materials in the ground. Uh, and that, if that's radioactive, then that will uh, decay over time. You have the decay of the fission products themselves. Um, the fallout cloud, which can travel, and that, that contains the fission products that can travel high into the atmosphere. Uh, and, um, and if it's detonated at a low altitude, can produce very, very deadly early fallout. If it's, if it's detonated at a very high altitude, then it will take time for those, for those particulates, those radioactive fallout, for it to fall to the ground. And that in the, in the time that it, that it takes to fall to the ground, a lot of that will have decayed to other isotopes mm -hmm. and so will be less radioactive. Um, and of course, this material that will be also due to bomb debris and, uh, and, and other, other things too. Uh, fallout patterns are uh, very complicated uh, to model, can only be, do, be done through uh, computer modeling, can also be kind of surprising as in the case of um, uh, the, the Fukushima incident uh, in Japan in 2011, um, the fallout pattern, uh, uh, you know, first went out towards the sea and then went back towards the land, and it was difficult to predict uh, 
uh, where, where it would be uh, without doing computer modeling. Um, so, so if you have, have uh, uh, you know, large explosions, um, then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the mushroom cloud will travel higher and you can kind of see that in, the, in this case here. And so all those contaminants will also travel higher and higher and higher um, into the atmosphere. And that also means it gets deposited um, further away. Now, keep in mind the idea of the energy being carried by the particles themselves. So the radioactive materials decay. These give off these particles. These are like the bullets uh, that can do uh, dan uh, damage to you. And there's many different types of bullets. It's the alpha particles, the beta particles. Alpha particles are not going to be a real problem. They're easily stopped. The beta particles are also less of a problem. It's the gamma rays that tend to travel through every, everything and um, tend to do a lot of damage. Uh, now there can be different types of damage to cells. Um, and this is generally true of uh, radioactivity. Uh, there's a deterministic effect and what's called a stochastic effect. Um, deterministic effect is a very short-term high dose ionizing radiation. So this would be the case like, like gamma rays. Um, this would be the case with, um, uh, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, if, if they were exposed uh, to uh, initially to a very uh, large dose. Whereas the stochastic effect is uh, over a longer period of time uh, where the person is exposed um, uh, to radiation. The two are a little bit different. In the case of stochastic effect, there doesn't seem to be a threshold at uh, where it happens. Um, so even if it's a very low dose of radioactivity, you'll still have an effect over the population. Stochastic meaning it's kind of random uh, over who would, who would, uh, who would suffer uh, the effect from a low dose of radiation. Some people will feel the effect and others won't. The cancer risk, risk will be increased. This is just a reminder of this incredible horror of radiation. This was the assassination of former uh, Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko in 2006. He was poisoned in, by a, um, a radioactive isotope called polonium 210, which is 138 day half-life. So it, over 138 day, half of it the basically the dose will decrease by a factor of two. <laughs> you wait another 138 days, then that dose will be decreased by a factor of two and so on and so on and so on. He was poisoned in his tea, uh, I believe in Italy, in November 1st, uh, 2006. And he died in November 23rd. Uh, sorry, of course it was the UK where he was poisoned. Uh, and he died in November 23rd, in, uh, two, only 22, 23 days later, um, he, he died, and you can see how, how he suffered. <clears throat> and this was further testimony from uh, Madame Satsuko Thurlow on accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> in the weeks, months, and years that followed, many thousands more would die, often in random and mysterious ways, from the delayed effects of radiation. Still to this day, Ra this day, radiation is killing survivors. So to summarize, prompt gammas and neutrons will come from the fission process. Betas, gammas, and alpha particles will come from radioactive decay of the fission products or induce radioactivity. The alpha particle, which I said, are not as dangerous. They are if you ingest it. So the case of the plonium to 10, which I was talking about, um, th those were actually alpha particles that, that killed um, Alexander Litvinenko. Uh, particles are like bullets damaging the body. Um, you, you have different measures for, uh, for, um, for measuring what the dose would be, and it's measured in terms of gray. It's called, called a gray uh, or a sievert. Uh, and if you have a high dose, something like exceeding one gray, um, it could, could uh, lead to acute radiation syndrome, which is this effect where you, uh, where you have a higher effect of radiation uh, uh, possibly of cancer and also as, as an effect on serious effect on the body. And if you have a very high effect and you don't treat it, it could lead uh, to death. Um, and, and, and particles that are exposed over the population uh, as a whole, 
will increase the cancer risk. So this is the low dose um, radiation. So to summarize, the effect of a nuclear explosion can be a destructive blast wave, uh, which is intensified by the air burst to this max stem that I talked about, uh, thermal energy, which can cause burns and massive fires, uh, initial radiation bursts for neutrons and gamma rays, uh, residual radiation, which is coming from the fission product decay and, and uh, other isotopes that have been produced through the uh, fission process. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's little medical response uh, which would be expected after an explosion because it's such a dramatic effect. Um, here I'm showing, because I've only covered a few of the effects, it's, it's a very complicated topic. There's, of course, many, many different effects that happen from something as catastrophic as a nuclear explosion. Um, but here I've kind of tried to show you all the different things that could happen. And the question is, will international organizations be able to cope with this if an explosion happened? A study recently by the Norwegian Radiation Protection Agency found that adequate countermeasures to a nuclear detonation simply do not exist, even given the vast resources Norway has at it its disposal. No official UN organization's mandate is to deal with such an event. No specific United Nations or interagency planning or exercises conducted have been done to prepare for a nuclear detonation. Well, there have been radiological incidents such as, well, there have been such preparation for radiological incidents such as the dirty bomb scenario. <clears throat> of course, there was a Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Um, and uh, this, this was a quote, I, th I think, from the, from the treaty, if only a small fraction uh, if only a small fraction of today's nuclear weapons were used, soot and smoke, from the, that's what I'm going to be talking about now in terms of the nuclear winter effects, from the firestorms would loft high into the atmosphere, cooling, darkening, and drying the Earth's surface for more than a decade. It would obliterate food crops, putting billions at risk of starvation, yet we continue to live in denial of this existential threat. So um, in the past, people have uh, kind of not taken the, uh, the concept of a nuclear winter very seriously in, in recent past. But that all changed when they did the careful studies in 2009 on what the effect would be from a, uh, um, a relatively small uh, nuclear exchange. And this was between uh, India and Pakistan. Um, and there's now been a kind of resurgence of the concept of a nuclear winter. It turns out, and, 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 and this was is possible now because of the incredible compu uh, computational um, capabilities uh, that we now have because of the, uh, uh, the studies done on climate change and all the modeling that's, that has taken place. Um, in case a, uh, an exchange as the one I was saying would happen, massive amounts of smoke and soot from the fires would rise in the upper atmosphere and the sunlight would be reflected back into space. This would, me would mean rapid and large drops in global surface temperatures, and you would have collapse of basic life-sustaining um, ecosystems. So this is the idea of the nuclear winter and the nuclear famine. And this is work that was done by Alan Robach and Owen Brian Toon and others uh, about the effect of a small nuclear war of 100 Hiroshima-type weapons between India and Pakistan which I might remember, remind you is only 0.03% of all the nuclear weapons in the world. So imagine a skirmish in Kashmir escalating due to poor communication, misunderstanding, panic, and fear. And perhaps this time we're not that lucky. The effects would be devastating with at least an immediate 20 million deaths. But the point is that's not all. And that's really the, the important point that I want to emphasize. There would be massive fires, fires fueled by winds, uh, five teragrams of smoke injected into the upper troposphere, and the heated soot particles would loft high in the upper atmosphere and block and absorb all light. You can kind of see this here. I've, uh, this is, uh, I think this, I don't know which day this is, but this is after the, uh, after the explosion. You can see kind of how this cloud now is covering this part of the earth, large part of the earth. And over time, after 49 days, 
the particles would blanket most of the inhabited Earth, blocking enough sunlight that skies would look overcast almost everywhere. And you can imagine what a dramatic, this is after day nine, this is day 49. You can imagine what a um, tremendous effect this would have on, on global temperatures, but then also on the uh, environment and agriculture. So this shows you the picture. This is uh, the temperature anomaly. So this is really global warming uh, as a function of time, going from 1880 all the way up to uh, 2010. And you see that if you imagine that you would have this dramatic effect where um, you would have a release of these 100, 100 weapons, an exchange of weapons between uh, India and Pakistan of 50 weapons each, you would have a dramatic change in temperature, drop in temperature, uh, which would only slowly start to creep back up. It would take about another decade. So it would be uh, um, unprecedented change in global temperatures in uh, human history. So the resulting soot cloud would block 7 to 10 percent of sunlight, leading to significant cooling and reductions um, in precipitation lasting for more than a decade. The growing season around the world is shortened, not allowing crops to reach maturity, which would lead to increase in the price of food, mass mass starvation, and of course hoarding by countries that have the funds. <coughs> um, the dis disease, war, and competition for food, and um, they expect that two billion people, two billion people of this planet um, would be at risk. But that's not all. If you have heating of the smoke particles high in the atmosphere, you have increase in local temperature by at least 50 degrees Celsius high in the atmosphere. If you have such a, a, a massive change in temperature high up in the atmosphere, it changes the uh, chemical rates, reaction rates of nitrogen oxides, uh, which depletes the, uh, the ozone layer, uh, which means that you have uh, also UV deplete would be cold, dry, and dark, and, uh, and a high amount of uh, UV uh, rays as well. Um, so ozone depleted. Um, which would have dramatic effects on skin cancer, eye, eye damage, and other health effects in humans and in animals. Um, the effect of the ozone depletion is large and long-lasting over time, um, but it's different at different uh, uh, latitudes. The effect would be very dramatic. The impact on agriculture is sudden cooling, less sunlight, less rainfall, shortened growing season, reduced crop yields, uh, ozone depletion uh, damages crops that are sensitive to UV, disruption of petroleum supplies, effects of use of farm machinery and fertilizer and pesticides, radioactive and toxic contamination, uh, taking out vital farmland out of production, and um, you would also expect a collapse of the global distribution system. So just in summary, the effect of multiple nuclear weapons are really catastrophic and really uh, dwarf that are due to global wars. Uh, the effects are sudden cooling and UV depletion. Um, leads to massive uh, global famine as the price of food increases, making it inaccessible to population already vulnerable to food pricing. And you would get massive starvation on a global scale. So I'm sorry to leave you with that very, very uh, negative picture, but um, this just tells you that it's uh, the effect, if you imagine that there would be a, a nuclear exchange between two countries, the effect is far, travels much further than just those two countries. It's everybody that would be affected by a nuclear exchange. And that's why it's so important to try to uh, uh, ban the use of these weapons. Um, because everybody would be affected if there would be, let's say, could be by accident, if there, you know, or misunderstanding, um, if there would be such a, such a uh, terrible event. Okay, so here I have some references. Um, this reference is here that I have here from the IPNW and uh, from Rutgers, where a lot of this uh, work was conducted on the, uh, uh, on the, um, the, the climactic effects of the nuclear war. Uh, and also the nuclear darkness 
uh, website here. These, uh, all these websites uh, talking much more detail than I have. There's the Nuclear Matters uh, website, which is an excellent book um, from, from the US military describing, uh, describing nuclear weapons and a little bit about how they work. But of course, they have classification rules that they have to be careful with. And the book that really describes in a great detail the effects of nuclear weapons is uh, Glaston and Dolan, which you can also find online. If you just type Glaston and Dolan, the effects of nuclear weapons, you can find uh, PDFs that are, uh, this is a very old book from 1977, uh, but there's many versions of this. You can, you can find um, editions online, um, which I believe are, are perfectly legal. Um, and then there's these two books by Craig and Jungerman, Nuclear Arms Race and uh, Dietrich uh, Schreuer, uh, Science, Technology and the Nuclear Arms Race, which are also excellent references on nuclear weapon effects, but also on nuclear weapons um, themselves. And that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Ferenc. So, let me... Not very rosy. Not rosy because we are talking about nuclear weapons effect. It <laughs> shouldn't be rosy, but thank you yeah. so much. It was a really excellent lecture and so many um, items, so much information to digest. It's difficult, but uh, very important. So let's see from Nelly to everyone. Do you have any uh, Thank you very much. All questions. Okay, all questions <laughs> answered. Great. Yes, in fact, uh, yeah, you answered a lot of uh, uh, questions that I also had. So, but uh, just for uh, some stimulated discussion, I, I really liked uh, that you used uh, the pictures. Um, draw by uh, atomic bombing survivors that really show the actual impact of the nuclear weapons. And as you also mentioned, uh, these humanitarian initiatives, uh, we, we have a separate lecture for the, like a disarmament, more diplomatic uh, aspect of a nuclear disarmament uh, lecture. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but one thing I am always amazed is, um, so nuclear weapon states, especially the United States, always said at the NPT or UN General Assembly first committee uh, meetings, they always said they are already fully aware of the catastrophic impact of the use of nuclear weapons. That they always said, so they fear there is no like a special need to rediscuss, you know, this issue. That's their kind of opposition toward the discussion on the humanitarian impact of the nuclear weapons. But as a nuclear scientist, uh, friends, do you think all those nuclear desi weapons designer, when they develop nuclear weapons, do you think uh, uh, they were able to use their imagination of the impact of the use of uh, the nuclear weapons if they, those weapons were used. What that's, do you think? Yeah, Masako, as usual, this is a very, very good question. Um, my own, own feeling not. Uh, I think I kind of tried to emphasize that people discounted the uh, the uh, original papers on nuclear winter. And they didn't really take it that seriously. So these were the original papers that were I think in the 1980s. Carl Sagan was one of the, one, one of the writers of it. Um, uh, and I think after the, I think it was the first Iraq war, um, they expected that um, because of the, um, the oil wells being lit on fire, uh, I think the Iraqis did this, um, yeah, they expected that the effect would be so dramatic and, and, and so they said that, well, you see, in this case, uh, nothing really happened and, um, and the effect wasn't so bad. 
Um, but in fact, and that, that's been kind of what, what, what people have been saying in the past, that the people who were supporting nuclear weapons. But this research that was done by, uh, 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 at Rutgers uh, by um, Roebuck and, uh, and others um, shows that there was information that they didn't know what the effects were going to be. So I think they very much downplayed the effect of what the, and, and there's books about this, um, that they purposely downplayed the effect of nuclear winter because they didn't want to people to be against nuclear weapons and to be scared of the effects of nuclear weapons and to have basically this sense of realizing that the effect is far more dramatic than they would have expected. So I think, I don't think that they really knew how dramatic this effect was because first of all, the, the computational power wasn't there yet in terms of the climate modeling so I think that the designers really didn't know how dramatic, some part of it they did know because the nuclear winter is an old, is an older concept. Um, but this recent research or, you know, the research over the last decade, that's entirely new. And I don't think that um, nuclear weapons designers could, can use that or, or, or people who are pro nuclear we weapons can say that all the effects of nuclear weapons are are understood and use that as uh, you know as you as you said in the um, in, in in the in the conferences. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I really agree that um, the actual impact, actual effects of the use of nuclear weapons are really downplayed and I think it's almost impossible to really understand the actual human suffering of the use of nuclear weapons. So I think the important thing about when it, so that's why I think this humanitarian discussion emerged. This, why this uh, discussion uh, received so much momentum because the international community change the discourse of how you discuss nuclear weapons. Because before they were focusing on how weapons work, how military works, but uh, uh, around 2010, the, uh, for, for the first time, the NPT Rebel Conference final documents included the, the, the wording, catastrophic consequences of the use of nuclear weapons. So, I think it's very important to study the actual impact from the humanitarian perspectives. And of course, it's important to study science. But as you said, it's both are very essential to understand. So, yeah, so I agree. And I think that's a very good, very good point. And, um, and in, in a sense, I've done the same thing because I kind of showed the, for the first part of the lecture, at least showed you kind of the local effects but the effect is far larger than this typical picture that you would have in Glaston and Dolan of more a local effect. It's far bigger in terms of what, what the climactic effect, the effect is on the climate. Yeah, I agree, I, I agree with your point. Thank you. And also, the, we often see the another resources, as you know, the nuke map, <laughs> yeah. Nuke map. And um, can you briefly, I, I plan to include a nuke map in the uh, useful resources. Uh, yes. But can you briefly talk about uh, how nuke yeah. map? Yes. So everything that I've been talking about essentially um, is codified in, uh, on, on, if, you, if you type nuke, nuke map uh, in Google, um, you'll go to a web page that's designed by a physicist um, or a historian, um, Alex Wellerstein, who has done some amazing work where he's taken, say, the blast effect and other effects, and he's tried to, tried to codify it into a web page where you can actually program um, your city or any location and see what the effect would be. And also now 
in terms of the number of, uh, of fatalities too and number of victims and so on. Um, and you can actually program that into the website and, and you can see what, what the local effect is, is going to be. Doesn't include, of course, this other effect that we're, we're talking about the nuclear winter because that's a very, very complicated, complicated um, calculation to do. But um, it is useful to see what the effect would be. So for example, of a Hiroshima type bomb in your city. Uh, and it really gives you a, a different perspective. The other uh, impact of the nuclear weapons, you also mentioned the impact to the human body. And of course, the intergenerational uh, effect. So now in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki, uh, there are already the fourth, fourth or third generation of uh, nuclear, yeah, atomic bombing survivors. And uh, I don't think there is a specific uh, medical record yet, but uh, I think those people have a larger concern regarding the probability to have a cancer. So I think this is also a very serious human impact. The, this, and especially, I recently heard some lecture, the radiation has a more effect on the women, I think. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, so especially uh, this discussion was uh, quite largely uh, done in the process of uh, negotiation of the, the uh, nuclear weapons ban treaty. So this is also a very interesting uh, aspect to study, especially now the um, importance of a uh, gender balance uh, to, to discuss nuclear issues. So women have uh, more to say about the radiation. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's another issue. So the, I, you also mentioned, uh, this is something I always get confused uh, myself, the, the residu residual radiation. And um, so I know you mentioned, but could you quickly mention uh, again, the why nuclear power plants accident, like a, for example, Fukushima or Chernobyl, people cannot go back to that area, but uh, places like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they can go back to the place to live without any problem. Okay, so since the explosion happened at a certain altitude, and remember I said something that, the, the, well, the fireball itself is really, really hot. And since just like a hot air balloon, a hot air balloon rises, but this is really hot, so it rises much quicker. So as certainly you have uh, neutrons and particles coming from it, but since you have a, it's at a very high altitude, the neutrons simply can't reach the ground and the gamma rays can't reach the ground because they'll be absorbed in between. So it won't do damage to people on the ground. And on top of that, it's rising really rapidly. So as it rises rapidly, you know, it, it, can, it can do, uh, it, it also, you know, the neutrons and particles can't, can't reach the ground. So the effect is going to be much less for the people on the ground. However, you still produce all kinds of uh, radioactive fallout. Right, so this is the bomb debris, the fission products that you produce and so on. All these will be little particles and these will tend to travel on winds over much larger distances. And in the end, they'll start to settle down. But if, they, but if it's really high in the altitude, really high altitude bomb, then those particulates will stay at a very high altitude and, and it will take a long time for them to come down, sometimes weeks or months. And by that time, it's already basically much less radioactive than it was. It's basically much less dangerous. If you're at a sort of in-between stage where you're not that high, but you're not that low, uh, then the, the, the particulates will start to come down. And if they come down within, you know, a certain, you know, in a, and if they're rained, rained out or something in a very short time, it'll fall to the ground and it'll still be very, very radioactive. So that's, that's really what's, what's going on there. Um, if you have a, a, a ground explosion, then what you do is you have the neutrons themselves that are 
causing the, the dirt and the rocks and something to actually become radioactive. So they changed from a stable element to, a, a, uh, um, to an isotope that's radioactive. So that's one thing. Or the radioactive fallout itself is going to be radioactive. And so it really depends on where the bomb exploded, what altitude it exploded, and, and those kinds of things, and what the effect is going to be. So but that, that's my understanding. That's why uh, people can still live now easily in Hiroshima, but Fukushima, okay, it's not as severe. Understand that, uh, that's understandable, um, but the particulates are, are, are still on the ground and, um, and uh, you know, people still really, really can't go back to the area. <laughs> Everything is about risk and it's about whether you want to accept the risk or you don't want to accept the risk. So at very low dose level, you have an increased rate of cancer over the population. So if the population decided to go back to say an area close to uh, Fukushima where, uh, where, where, where we know it's contaminated, then there's a certain risk that the cancer rate um, is higher. And so that's something that, you know, that, that uh, the government or the people have to decide on what, what, is, the, what is the best option to take. Do you see what I'm saying? <coughs> yes, great. Thank you. So uh, do we have any other question from the audience? If uh, there is any question, please uh, type. And uh, if not, uh, yeah, you also mentioned a very important thing. Uh, once the nuclear weapon was used, no adequate response is possible. And this was also stated by the International Red Cross, ICRC. So the bottom line is, we also discussed this in a previous session, but we definitely need to prevent any use of nuclear weapons. That's a very, very important premise when we discuss. But obviously some people are talking about some use of nuclear weapons. So we really need to, when we study nuclear issues, we, like this year's topic says, nuclear risk is increasing. So it's so important to study the, what's the real risk. And we need to study how we could prevent the, any use of nuclear weapons, both accidentally and intentionally. So that's, I really uh, strongly believe. So, Thank you so much, Ferenc. That was really great uh, lecture. And uh, of course, we have to review the video many couple of times and uh, uh, digest uh, this information. But um, uh, do you have uh, any final comments or any uh, like a final message that our audience, our students, our teachers would like you to take away from your lectures? I guess uh, the important thing is, um, and I think I really appreciated what you said about the, uh, the importance of gender issues in this. There's a lot of aspects of something like nuclear weapon effects that really haven't been explored enough. Uh, it's such a catastrophic effect with so many different aspects to it um, that uh, we really need to understand everything to really see a picture of how, how immense the effect is uh, of these bombs. You, you can't really capture it in this small, in a short presentation like this, as you know. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ferenc. Uh, but we learned quite a lot of things from your lecture. So I really appreciate your excellent lecture. So for those who are watching this video, I hope uh, you study this issue. Uh, very seriously, I know you are doing. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for your participation in the uh, online workshop. So we will come back uh, tomorrow afternoon with a, a more like a policy oriented lecture tomorrow. So, okay, so I'm going to uh, close this session. Thank you.